Grace and peace to you all in the name of our still speaking God, who loves us just the way we are, and who loves us too much to let us stay that way. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are truly our strength and our salvation our hope, and our healer. Amen. Well, today is your lucky day. You get two sermons for the price of one. <laughs> Sermon number one is titled, A Lesson in Gratitude. The story of Jesus healing ten lepers is found only in the Gospel of Luke. In every other instance in Scripture in which Jesus heals a leper, it is always a one-on-one -on -one exchange. And that is what the Bible calls them. The Bible calls them lepers. Not people with leprosy, but lepers. As though their deep disease defined them. And in many ways it did. You see, in Jesus' day, the word leprosy, it was used to describe a broad range of skin conditions. There were lots of different forms of leprosy. It doesn't necessarily mean the disease that we call leprosy today. It included things like breaking out in hives or having ringworm. But no matter what the imperfection of the skin was, if it was called leprosy, then it was treated the same. The law made no provision for a bad case of psoriasis or acne. No, leprosy was leprosy, and if the priest said you had it, then the law was clear. According to the book of Leviticus, the 13th chapter, if a person, even a child, even a young child was found to have leprosy, that person was put out of the community immediately. The law said that they were required to wear their hair disheveled, to wear clothes made of torn rags. They could not come within 50 paces of a person who did not have leprosy. And everywhere they went, they had to cover their mouth and shout out loud, Unclean! Unclean! The person in Jesus' day who had leprosy was a social outcast alienated from family and community of life. Knowing that they couldn't interact with anyone else besides other lepers, it makes sense that they would come together to Jesus as a group. The only people that the law allowed them to interact with was each other. Ten people forced to live in isolation, had found a way not to be quite so isolated. Outcast from their communities, they formed a community of their own. They had become the friends and family to one another that each one of them needed. And then, for perhaps the first time in their lives, there was hope for a cure. When this group, this community of outcasts, learned that Jesus was traveling through and they had heard of the miraculous ability he had to heal people. They agreed that they would go together and ask Jesus to heal them. The scripture said that they kept their distance as they approached Jesus. They knew the law requiring them to stay 50 paces away from another person. And they did as the law commanded. From a distance, they shouted out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priests. Somewhere along the way to the temple, the members of this group looked at each other and realized that their afflictions were gone, that they were healed, that there were no more marks on their skin. And the Bible says that one of the ten, a Samaritan, went back. Praising God with a loud voice, he fell at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But where are the other nine? Well, one thing is for certain, they aren't 
there. They haven't returned to Jesus. They haven't come back to thank Jesus for healing them. And as such, they are missing out on one of the most important parts of their healing. They are missing out on a chance to express the joy and the hope that this miracle has brought them. Which brings me to the conclusion of sermon number one. It's important for us to give thanks, to be thankful. We should express our thanks when someone does something nice for us. We should definitely express our thanks when God does something incredible for us. Every major spiritual tradition in the world emphasizes the importance of gratitude because being grateful for your life, as science and psychologists will tell you, it will make you a kinder and happier and more optimistic person. And with Thanksgiving only, what, six weeks away now? It is, this story is a good reminder that we ought to spend that holiday of Thanksgiving actually giving thanks. We should give thanks to God and be grateful for everything that we have. Focus on the things that we have and not worry quite so much about the things that we don't. Amen? Amen. Sermon number two. A lonely Samaritan. When the one Samaritan no longer covered in leprosy, returned to Jesus to give thanks, Jesus asked the question, were not ten made clean? But where are the other nine? Now in one sense, we can interpret that as a rhetorical question, right? Where are the other nine? Well, clearly they're not here giving thanks, and maybe they should be. But here's the thing. That question isn't necessarily rhetorical. I mean, the other nine are doing just exactly what Jesus told them to do. Jesus told them, go to the priests, present yourselves to the priests. And then they can be pronounced clean and whole and fit to rejoin the community by the priests. They would no longer be unclean. They would no longer be outcast. They would get to go back to living whatever lives they were living before their leprosy. And then maybe this former group of lepers would keep in touch with one another. I mean, after all, they had been through a lot together, right? These ten people who had relied on each other while they were outcasts. <coughs> there was a time in their lives where these ten were the only people in the world that they could speak to. So maybe they would stay in touch. But maybe they wouldn't. And after all, they'd be busy now. They'd be able to get back to work back to their families, back to their communities, back to worshiping in the temple. There was so much to do now. And maybe, frankly, their time on the margins of society, living as lepers, maybe that was something they just as soon forget. A chapter in their life that they would prefer to close. They don't have to be outcasts anymore. Those nine. Those nine don't have to be outcasts anymore. But not so with the Samaritan. Because the Samaritan is twice outcast. He is a double outsider. Not only did all of Jewish society cast him out because he was a leper, but even after his leprosy was gone, he was still an outcast for being a Samaritan. There is no ritual that the priests in the temple could perform that would make him acceptable in Jewish society. In fact, he wouldn't even be allowed in the temple in the first place. Knowing that, it makes perfect sense that the Samaritan turned around and came back to Jesus. He no doubt realized as he was on his way to the temple with his nine friends, wait a minute, I'm a Samaritan. They won't let me in the temple. His nine friends might have had business in the temple, but he did not. I wonder how that conversation went when he realized that he couldn't go with his nine friends to the temple. I mean, what words could he have come up with to say, friends, I can't go with you anymore. Here we have to part. 
And I wonder if his nine friends stopped on their journey and cried and hugged him and said goodbye. Or were his nine friends so excited to get back home, back to their families and their jobs, that their goodbyes were quick and cursory? Was this Samaritan mostly happy for his friends, or was he crushed when he realized that he alone was still an outcast? And as the other nine went on their way, he was left alone. We don't know. The story doesn't say. The Bible doesn't tell us. What it does say is this. Ten people were brought together by a tragedy to support one another in their common affliction. They didn't have anyone else in the world except for one another. And then, when the common misfortune that had united them was no longer a part of their lives, nine continued on their way to the temple, and one lonely Samaritan was left by himself. And it seems almost blasphemous for me to say this, and I wouldn't say it if it weren't suggested by the Bible itself, but for the Samaritan in this story, Jesus' power to heal was limited. Jesus could take away his leprosy, but Jesus couldn't take away his society's racism that looked down on Samaritans simply for being Samaritans. What the Samaritan needed was more than healing. He needed a community. He needed a community that would love and support him. He needed a place where he could go, where he could be welcomed and be a part of something bigger than himself. And sisters and brothers, that is where you and I come into the story. Which brings me to the conclusion of sermon number two. We cannot heal the sick. There are doctors and nurses and pharmacists for that. What we can do is we can pray for the sick, and we can visit the sick, and we can let them know that no matter what they are going through in their life, they will not be going through it alone. We cannot take away the weight and the guilt of sin. Only God's Holy Spirit can do that. But we can be a community that welcomes people carrying heavy burdens and help them to find peace and hope in Christ Jesus. We can be a place to go for those who have nowhere else to go. When I was a seminary student in the Twin Cities, I went on a field trip to a rather unusual church called Solomon's Porch. And at this church, they had a custom of one Sunday every month asking one member of their congregation to get up and share a testimony. And that happened to be the Sunday that my class and I came to visit that church on our field trip. That morning, a man stood up and he told this story, which I am about to tell you. He said, I was addicted to meth, but I was homeless. I slept on couches or in basements of friends' houses, and sometimes, sometimes I just slept on the street. And there was a strip mall that was close to one of the places where I was staying, and in the strip mall they had both a bakery and a coffee shop. And so a lot of days, when I had come down, I would go to this strip mall and I would wait, because if I waited long enough, the bakery would throw away their old rolls, or the coffee shop would throw away their old coffee, and I could usually convince the owners to give me a roll or a cup of coffee before they threw the rest of it away. But some days, the bakery would sell out, or the coffee shop would sell all of their coffee, or both. Some days I would wait on the curb outside that strip mall for hours and get nothing. And then one day I noticed a couple blocks away this church. They had services four days a week. And whenever they had services, they had their doors wide open. And the people coming and going from that building, they always seemed to have coffee or food in their hands. And so one day I went in. And there was this great big table with rolls and fruit and cheese and meat and cookies. There were four different kinds of coffee. And so I went over to the table and I started taking whatever I could. I was 
I was eating and putting stuff in my pockets, and I was trying not to talk to people or to look at people in case they would realize that I wasn't a member of this church and I didn't belong here. But after only a few minutes, on my first day there, a man came up to me and he asked me, How is everything? Do you have everything you need? Do you need anything that you don't have? I said, no, I'm fine, I'm good. He walked away and I ate food and I drank coffee and the service started, but I stayed out there eating the cookies and drinking the coffee. And I did the same thing the next day and the next week. Every day that the church was open, I was there. And every time that same man would walk up to me and ask me the same question. How is everything? Do you have everything you need? Do you need anything you don't have? And this went on for months. I started to feel guilty. And one day as I was eating the food and drinking the coffee, that same man came up and asked me again, how is everything? Do you have everything you need? Do you need anything that you don't have? And I just started to cry. I said, I'm not a member of this church. I don't come in for worship. Most of the time that I come in here, I'm high on meth. I'm high on meth right now. The man said, I know. I have known since the first day that you walked in here. And I am so glad that you are here. Because when you're here, I know that you're warm. And I know that you've got food. And every week that you come back, I know that you have stayed safe this last week. And that homeless addict, he wiped the tears away from his eyes and he said, how did you know I was high? And his host said, how do you think I found this church? And the man sharing the story concluded by saying that he was now a member of the church, that he was in worship every Wednesday and every Sunday. He was clean and sober for three years. And he was now the head of the Coffee Fellowship Committee. <laughs> that Samaritan leper found healing in Jesus, but he was still an outcast without a community. And that is where you and I come in. Oh, yes. If this is to be a church in any meaningful sense of the word, then this is a place where people who have had, had every other door slammed in their face find doors that are open and people who are welcoming. We are called by God to be a community for those who have no community of their own. We are here to welcome the lost, the outcast, the addict, the homeless, the lonely. Because after all, we have been there too. In one way or another, at some point or another in our lives, we have known what it feels like to be alone. That's how I found the church. And that's how Christ found me. Amen. Amen.